TorahCafe.com. Rabbi Yossi Jacobson and Rabbi Yitzhak Shahed will apply wit, humor, and intellectual panache in a deeply serious debate. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rabbi Chaim Benoka, and I'm going to serve as your moderator this afternoon for a very serious debate. The Latka Hamantashen debate is a deliberately humorous slash academic debate about the relative merits and meanings of these two items of, in Jewish culture. Many of you may be under the mistaken impression that this debate started some 70 years ago in 1946 at the University of Chicago. But in reality, this debate goes back some 3,328 years to the Jews at Sinai, also in the desert. We stood there at Sinai. We fetched our way through it. God gave us the manna. Our sages tell us that the manna tasted like anything you wanted it to taste like. So if you like latkes, it tastes like latkes. Like hamatashen, it tastes like hamatashen. Now you might ask, well, hey, the story of Hanukkah and Purim had yet to happen. How do they even know about latkes and hamatashen? That's something that the rabbis might want to address in their debate. But be it as it may... After thousands of years of debate and deep, deep discussions and Talmudic dissertations regarding this subject, it is time to put this baby to rest. Once and for all, we need to resolve this debate through two great rabbis who are here to represent both that of the Hamitashin and the Latka. Uh, representing the Latka this afternoon, we have none other than Rabbi Yitzchak Shachat from London, England. And representing the Hamantashen is none other than Rabbi Yossi Jacobson from Muncie, New York. We are going to have an eight-minute presentation from both of the debaters, back-to-back, -back, followed by a counter-argument or rebuttal of five minutes each, followed by Q&A by the audience. It'll be kind of like a town hall type of thing. There's two mics on either side. I ask you to line up, one behind the next, that is, in size order, and uh, ask questions, you will, and I ask you to please be concise, succinct, and, and concise in your questioning. The moderators will have 45 seconds to answer your question. Please direct your question to either one of the speakers and not both. And that finally will be uh, followed by closing statements by, uh, for three minutes each, either by both rabbis and then the voting. Let me tell you about the voting. Now, some of you know a little bit about voting because there's some buzz going on in the United States about voting. We have our own voting system here. As this debate has gone on for thousands of years and, and records have been lost as to who won what debate, you know, thousands of years ago, some of it was, some of it was written in Sanskrit, other in hieroglyphics, Old Hebrew, etc. Today we got a whole different system. We're doing a vote. Does everybody have a cell phone with them here? Everybody gets an opportunity to vote. As long as you have text messaging ability, messaging ability on your phone, you're in. We are going to ask you to vote as to what is the more popular of the two, either a hamatash and or a latka. Okay, now in terms of answering the question, which is a superior? For the Hamantash, you're going to hit A and then send. For the Latka, you're going to hit B and send. The way this is going to work is that we're not going to show you the results of your poll right now. That's going to be shown to you at the end of the debate. And the way the winner is going to be determined as follows. Let's assume for argument's sake that you have 90%, I don't want to prompt anybody, but 90% say for the Latka and 10% for the Hamatash. But by the time the debate is over and we re-vote once again, it's 80% for the Latka and 20% for the Hamatash. The Hamatash will win because it went up by 10 points. Follow? So whichever one goes up in a greater increment in terms of points is going to be deemed the winner of tonight of today's debate. To get us started here, we have Rabbi Yitzhak Shachat, who's going to be the debater on behalf of the Latka. Rabbi Yitzhak Shachat. Thank you. Haman Tash. Listen to the word. Repeat it to yourself several times. I don't care what the filling, I don't care what the significance, the bottom line is, it has the word Haman in it and it conjures up imagery of an evil man who sought to annihilate the Jewish people. Make no mistake about it, Haman was a man no less evil than Hitler, Yamach Shemai. Did you hear that? Yamach Shemai. Judaism mandates that we say Yamach Shemai, may his name be obliterated whenever we mention someone inherently evil. Indeed, whenever we say 
Haman in the Megillah, we are expected to boo and bang in order to obliterate his name. And yet, here we are with this gluten-packed, saturated, trans-fat-filled cookie, calling it with the same name of this evil man and then eating it, ingesting it, making it a very real part of ourselves. Why would I want to do that? At best, call it Haman Butash. The name is wrong, full stop. Now let's talk about the shape of the Haman Butash. It's distinctly triangular. Some suggest this reflects the shape of Haman's ears. Hence, in Israel, they call it Azne Haman. Really? When is the last time you saw someone with triangular ears like that? Except maybe Star Trek's Mr. Spock and Leonard Nimoy was a nice Jewish boy. Others maintain that it reflects the shape of Haman's hat, somewhat similar to that which I don't know, Napoleon or George Washington War. If you research, you will find that such triangular hats only emerged in the 16th or 17th century. In fact, if anyone here can show me categorical evidence that people wore hats like that back then, I will eat my hat. So it is suggested maybe it takes on a little bit of the shape of the mug and David, but then you have to ask, why stop halfway? Why not shape the cookies already in a full mug and David? Bottom line, the shape makes no sense, full stop. So you see, the hamantash is inherently inconsistent. The name makes no sense. The shape makes no sense. So let's move on to the filling. And here, aha, we get a little bit closer to the truth. The primary filling was supposed to be poppy seed. This reflects the very food that Esther survived off whilst striving to keep kosher in the king's palace. Mun is Yiddish for poppy seed. And so pockets of poppy seed, or mun tashin, is what it was intended to be called before it evolved into hamen tashin, which is essentially a corruption of the mun word. Mun tashin, pockets of poppy seed. Okay. So can someone please explain to me, how did we get to cherry tushin? Why we have plum tushin, chocolate tushin, apricot tushin, prune tushin. For goodness sakes, ladies and gentlemen, prune tushin. I mean, it's great for the digestive system, more suited for Pesach, you know, let my people go. It's got nothing to do with Purim. So even as we strive to find a reason for the hamantash, we don't even remain true to it. We distort it. We've corrupted it and created something altogether different out of it. And get this. Did you know that poppy seed is banned in most countries in the Middle East as well as some in the Far East? That's right. If you were to spend Purim in Dubai or Singapore and bring a poppy seed hamantash with you, you could be spending the next four years behind bars. Do I really want to give credit to a food that is essentially banned in numerous countries? So let's talk about the latka. It is, as it is called, a potato pancake. Its shape is typically round. It has no filling. The inside and its outside is consistent potato. And it's not banned in any country anywhere on earth. Why we eat it is not a matter of conjecture. We know that it requires deep frying in oil and eating it conjures up images, not of some evil Jew hater, but of oil, which as you know is integral to Jewish ritual, both in its content as well as symbolism. Oil was used on the altar. Oil was used to anoint kings and priests. Oil, of course, was used in the menorah. We can mock oil. We can talk about oil as fattening or a waste of resources. But where would Judaism be without oil? Oil is distilled essence. It is separate, and therefore it rises to the top. At the same time, it spreads about thus permeating throughout. That's the story of the Jew. That is the uniqueness of the Jew rising to the top while spreading throughout, being a light onto the nations. Whilst the hamantash reflects our victory, its name, its shape, it all reminds us of our enemies, thus stirring up feelings of threats that still linger. The latke, on the other hand, reminds us of our uniqueness as Jews and our special mission in this world. Furthermore, Purim is, of course, all about our physical victory, and the hamantash serves as part of that reminder. Do I really need to eat some triangular-shaped, prune-filled, wheat-laden pastry 
to remind me of my ability to outlive my enemies. Frankly, I need only look in the mirror to appreciate that. Pharaoh was gone. Haman is gone. Stalin is gone. The Nazis are gone. But I am still here standing before you as a proud Jew in this 21st century. Hanukkah is about the spiritual victory. The Greeks had one primary objective, to assimilate the Jew into one hodgepodge of multicultural idealism. And against that, my friends, I need every possible reminder I can get because there are so many assaults on basic Jewish mores and principles today. Barriers are coming down. People are scrambling over. We need the latke as a crucial reminder of our paramount responsibilities. And finally, what do Maya in Villanova, El Gaucho in Bratislava, Scots in London, Le Maris in Paris, and Le Caprice in New York City all have in common? They are all supreme non-kosher restaurants, and they all have latkes on their menu. Not because Jews frequent their restaurants, but because even the non-Jew has an appreciation. He's become enraptured by the finesse of the Jew. Most non-Jews, and sadly many a Jew too, have no clue what a hamantash is. But every Jew and a large proportion of non-Jews know a latka. And I suggest to you that with the resurgence of anti-Semitism, if the way to a man's heart is through his stomach, the latka might just be the perfect antidote. And let's be honest, if you pick out all the poppy seed from hamantash, you could probably chemically modify it and extract the opium by which you can give yourself a nice high. But if you extract all the oil by squeezing enough latkes, you can fuel fires to warm up the lives of others. The Jew is not just about getting his own high. He's every bit and even more so about warming up the lives of others. So I grant you, the supreme latke came along well after the inferior hamantash. Potatoes were, of course, not readily available on the continent for a long time. But the issue here isn't the latke per se. It's the essential ingredient, the oil. The oil-saturated latke reminds me that like oil, I must rise to the top. Like oil, I must permeate throughout. So friends, always remember, as per what it says right here on my T-shirt, live life, love latkes. Thank you, Rabbi Shachai. And now, in defense of the Hamantash, without any further ado, Rabbi Yossi Jacobson, eight minutes. Seven qualities that capture the timeless glory, the shining story of God's people. Number one, the greatest power and skill of the Jewish people was not that we stood up against our enemies, we prevailed, we endured, we triumphed, we fought, we defended ourselves, we defeated them. Eh, that's the small part. The great glory and story of the Jewish people is we took our very enemies and we turned them into delicious foods. <laughs> ah, Mechaya. We took Haman and we turned them into a homentage. We took Pharaoh, we turned him into a matzo ball canadal. What did Jacob tell the wrestling angel? I will not send you away till you bless me. It's not enough for the Jew to expel the foe, to rid himself or herself from the opponent. The Jew says, if I had to confront my skeleton, my demon, my enemy, my insecurity, my fear, my ghost. It's in order to become stronger, to become more blessed, to become more powerful, to take my enemy and to turn him into a sweet, delicious food. A hamantash. Where does Haman live today? In my bloodstream. <laughs> I'm Purim. Number one. Number two, the Jew believes in modesty. Not everything has to be visible. The latke is like Facebook. Everything is on the open. Some things have to stay 
behind closed doors, boundaries, privacy, confidentiality, shut down the iPhone, the hamantash, the symbol of tznius. Where are you, Molly? Modesty. Next, a Jew has direction in life. Direction. You're not going in circles. There's corners. You go here, you go there. There's focus, there's missions, there's purpose. Next, the triangle, Kabbalistically. Chesed, chesed, gvura, tiferes. Attraction, rejection, empathy. The right, the left, the middle, the synthesizer. A half a mug and David. Jewish pride, of course a half a mug and David. We're always growing. We're never smug and content. But there's more, there's more, my friends. Number five, a dessert. It's a dessert. It's not the main meal. Dessert is associated with pleasure. Jews always start with a dessert. <laughs> Who cares for the meal? We go straight for the dessert. The hamantash is a dessert. Number six, a Jew is a creative soul. You take a poppy seed. It's called man. Of course it's called man. But that's what a Jew does. From man we made homon. That's what creative minds do. We take poppy seeds. We turn them into homons. We take a homontash, which is really a montash. And with our creative minds, we have expansive consciousness. And that could only happen on Purim when people do things to expand their consciousness. And the poppy seed and the homon are more or less identical. And of course, the Talmud says, what's the source of Haman? In the Torah, it's the verse in Genesis, Hamin Have you eaten from this tree that I told you not to eat? In other words, in the imagination of the Talmud, Haman is represented with every type of food, hence poppy seed and apricots and prunes and everything from the tree of knowledge, whatever you can get in there. Now look at my poor, impoverished, pathetic latke. Number one, no modesty. No privacy. Everything is on Facebook. A shanda. <laughs> Number two, no direction, circles, everything in circles. Ambiguous, pathetic, spineless Jew. No morals, no identity, no conviction. He follows what the crowd says, the ultimate conformist. No mug and David. No three spheres, just confusion. It's not a dessert, it's not pleasurable. It's a heavy, oily, sickening, unhealthy carb. And it turns out it was the best foods that Jewish mothers offer to their children. They always read your mother, your grandmother, eat another latke, eat another latke, eat another. Turns out your own mother was trying to kill you. <laughs> On Purim, it doesn't make a difference because we're drunk. <laughs> There's no depth to the word latke, no creativity, no man, no Haman. Eh. What is more? The latke represents assimilation. You take the potato, you grade it. You destroy its identity. And now you mix in whatever you could put in. You put in salt, you put in eggs, you put in oil, and what's left of you? There's nothing left after three generations. Only a mikvah of oil. That's what assimilation looks like. Don't grate yourself. Don't mix in every ingredient. Remain loyal to your dough and your poppy seeds. And finally, my theory is, it must be that the writers of the protocols of the elders of Zion, accusing the Jews of wanting to take over the world, must have been eating latkes. Because that's what oil is. The message of oil is it saturates everything. It penetrates everything. And when they saw the Jews celebrating latkes, they said there must be a conspiracy. They want to take over the whole world. The hamantash represents the modesty of the Jewish people. And so there are many dangers threatening the Jewish people today. We have Iran, we have Hamas, we have Hezbollah, we have Syria, we have ISIS. But chief among them is the Latka. <laughs> and my friends, my friends, we have very many, not enough, 
factors that are contributing to the survival and continuity of the Jewish people. The Torah, the education, the schools, JLI, our homeland Israel, but chief among them. That key to survival and eternal continuity is, of course, the Hamantash. Thank you very much. And now for the rebuttal, Rabbi Shochet, five minutes. <laughs> when Rabbi Jacobson came in at that end, I was kind of hoping he was going to sit down at the piano and play you a song about the Hamantash. Because frankly, apart from any sort of music that you might conjure up in relation to the Hamantash and all the sort of concocted tunes that he's just put forward to you, there is no real rationale, there is no real substance to any of the essential arguments about what that hamantash represents. Do we add to the, hum, to the, to the latke, maybe applesauce, sour cream, relish, etc.? Of course we do. Just as we add salt to challah, we add pepper to our cholent, we add crane to our gefilte fish, who doesn't like to add a little bit of spice to life? All of Hasidism is essentially referred to Kabbalah as the spice upon the actual, as the flavoring of the food. Take away the sour cream, take away the applesauce, take away the salt and the pepper, and you still have a latka. Take out the poppy seed, take out the prunes, take out the chocolate, take out the apricots, and you have a wonton or a fortune cookie, and that's about it. <laughs> so you can stand here and you can pontificate and you can say that the latka isn't true to itself, but we know where the truth really lies. The fact is, Haman, as has been pointed out, is alive and well in Gaza, in Lebanon, in Syria, and his enabler, Achashverosh, the then king, is alive and well as well in the United Nations, in the parliament in the United Kingdom, and yes, to no small measure, in the White House as well. And I suggest to you that I mentioned before that these poppy seed filled triangular biscuits are banned in much of the Middle East. They'll tell you it's because of the poppy. I think it runs a lot deeper than that. I think it has everything to do with Islamic fundamentalism. You hear that, Barak? I said it. And as such, in its own way, the Hamantash itself poses a threat to our national security. I can tell you, the Baal Shem Tov famously said that when it comes to food and the significance of the latka, he used the parable of a child who sent away by his father, the king, to a distant land to get a feel of what it's like to be out in the world, where there he achieves real meaning and purpose. And once a year, the king sends a letter to his son. Only, of course, the son can't acknowledge the letter because he can't disclose his identity. So he throws a party. The people, they come for the free food, but he knows what he's really celebrating. The soul, it comes down here into this world. We're sent by our father up above to come into the world very deliberately to mix with our surrounds, to impact our surrounds. But unfortunately, the soul is masked over by an animalistic, coarse, crass self that is motivated by whims and natural inclinations and the appetitive powers. And so we introduce the latka on the one hand, that's the king sending his letter to his son, with which on the one hand, the body thinks he's now getting a free meal, but the soul understands the deeper message that is being conveyed over here. The soul understands what the latka truly represents, that it is circular, that life has no end, that life is in fact circular, that is undeniable. Beratius, the first word of the Torah, begins with the letter Bays because there is no end. We always start in the middle. There is no page one in any Talmud. It always begins with page two because when you finish, we tell you, you never even really began. Life is circular like the very Latka itself. It doesn't have different points. It doesn't have different ends. And so I only insist of all of you here, by the way, I noticed that as you all came in, you consciously picked up a Hamantash rather than a Latka and put that on your plates. And that's because it's so rare. It's so unusual. It's not an experience you normally typically share in. And there's a reason for that. It's because subconsciously, it's not an experience that you want to share in. We like to keep ourselves at a distance from all the negativity that the Homan Boo Tash conjures up and represents. Embrace the Latka, understand its underlying theme, appreciate the oil that is truly the essence of the Jew and everything that he or she represents. 
And frankly, he might tell you, the more latkes you eat, the more weight you will gain. I tell you, the more latkes you eat, the more spiritually refined you will become. If you don't believe me, you can take that up with Weight Watchers. They maintain that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Shachar. Now to rebut the rebuttal, Rabbi Yossi Jacobson. First of all, I am very subjective in this argument. You see what I look like? It's because of the latkes. It's very, very serious. So we're dealing here with a force that wants to destroy and kill out every Jewish father and turn the Jewish nation into orphans. How will you tolerate words that call for the annihilation of the Jewish people by a British esteemed rabbi? The first time in history, as far as I know, that a spiritual leader gets up and schemes a plot by which to exterminate most of the Jewish people who are all latke addicts. This is almost a reincarnation of Bilam, of Balaam happening all over again. I say it's time to protest. I will not be part of this scheme. History will not record me as a man who contributed to the annihilation of my beloved people. I stick to the hamantash, and I remain skinny. That's the resolution of this JLI conference. Another very interesting quality. Did you notice the difference? I dedicated the first five minutes to talk about the beauty of the hamantash. Once you got that, I went to denigrate the latka. My esteemed opponent did it the other way around. He began with attacking the hamantash. Now who begins with degrading the other? The one who is not confident with their own position. I love the hamantash. I don't have to negate the latke. Once I did it, I had some extra time. Because usually I speak short. And I didn't know what to do with the last three and a half minutes. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. So I decided I'll give credence to the latke if only to tear it down. But to start with the latke, I don't even acknowledge it as a reality that I have to contend with it. I am comfortable with my hamantash, my friends. I'm comfortable in my own skin besides the fat because that's the latke. And that's the part of myself that I don't like. And I go to therapy for that because of my addiction to latkes for my mother and grandmother and great-great-grandmother for many generations. In fact, Mrs. Resnick came over to me by lunch. She said, you must be the, the latke because your mother makes such good latkes. Little did she know what a dark skeleton she was opening <laughs> up by bringing to the fore the greatest enemy of the Jewish people. And finally, the esteemed rabbi keeps on talking about no name. How can one forget that the ultimate objective of Judaism and the ultimate objective of life and the ultimate objective of creation was not to avoid darkness. It was to confront darkness and transform it into light. Life is filled with skeletons. Everybody has a little Haman lurking in them. Have you not? Don't you have voices in you that want to destroy you? Don't you have demon skeletons, ghosts, fears, insecurities, obsession, guilt, fear that wants to kill you just like Haman, that wants to underwind you, paralyze you, destroy you? What do you do with your Haman? There's two options. Number one, you repress it. You make fun of it. You get up and you talk about how terrible it is. I challenge you today to take your skeletons, to take your Haman, and turn it into a delicious food. See your weaknesses as a catalyst, as a springboard for rejuvenation, for unprecedented growth. Thank you very much. Thank you, esteemed rabbis, for the rebuttal and rebuttal of the rebuttal, etc. 
We now have an opportunity for Q&As. Anybody would like to make a quick line in either microphone right here for short, concise, succinct questions with a 45-second answer directed to either rabbi. Feel free to get up to the mic. Anyone else who wants to have a question, you can, there's a mic, mic available to my left. Say hi to Mike. Anyone else has any other questions, just please get in line behind the uh, questionnaires. Is it not brought down by our sages that when the Mashiach comes, that there will only be one holiday that is observed, and that holiday is Purim, making the Humantashen the hands-down winner of this debate? Ay, Geval, Geval, do you hear what this brilliant, young, handsome, skinny, slim man said? And do you know why he has such insight? Because he doesn't eat latkes. And he said that the Midrash says that when the Messiah comes, there will be one holiday remaining. Meaning, which one? Purim. Do you understand what that means, friends? Latkes are facing obliteration within perhaps a few seconds or a few minutes. Mostly a few days. Five seconds. Latkes <laughs> will endure for eternity. Am Yisrael Chai. I mean, Haman Tashin Chai. Am Yisrael Chai. Thank you. <laughs> Next question. Like to whom would you slip. like... To whom would you like to refer your question? Um, Rabbi Jacobson. Rabbi Jacobson, go for it. You mentioned um, that in your opening statements, you only got to, you know, degrading the latka once you were finished with the humantashen. If the humantashen is so great, how come you were only able to talk about it for four and a half minutes? Ah. Okay. Rabbi Jacobson. My dear friends, my dear friends, the deepest secrets and most precious ideas in life you don't need more than a few minutes to convey them. How long was Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech? You think it was like a rabbi's sermon? How long was Lincoln's Gettysburg Address? How long? How long are the Ten Commandments? Not more than four minutes. I rest my case. Thank you, Rabbi Jacobson. Rabbi Shockett, each of the two foods that are being represented here represent a holiday. Which of the two holidays is actually a biblical holiday? Neither of the two holidays are actually biblical holidays per se, but it has to be said, of course, that when the Torah tells us that we have to adhere to the dictates and edicts of our rabbis, that means that when they felt the need later on to implement these holidays, that they become of biblical proportion. And to be sure, when Mashiach comes, of course, there will no longer be a Hanukkah because Hanukkah represents the underlying theme of our exalt state. It's precisely now that we celebrate Hanukkah, precisely now when we eat the latkes, precisely now when we put so much emphasis and focus on the actual oil itself to see our way to fuel the fires out of this exile in order to eventually come to Purim with the arrival of Mashiach, when I assure you, we will not be eating hamantashen. We will just be celebrating in a far more spiritual and ethereal way. Thank you, Rabbi Shochat. Rabbi Shochat, both uh, foods represent a holiday. However, hamantashen is unique to Purim, while the latka is, uh, has a competition from the donut. So how would you address that problem? And that's a very good point. In fact, if you think about it, the hamantash itself is restricted to just the one day in the year. You will not find it, not in Schwartz's Bakery in California or in Weiss's Bakery in Florida, any time of the year other than just before Purim. The latkes will always be around. The donuts will always be around. There is precisely the point of how all these things represent the underlying theme of oil, each in their own unique way. So the latke is supreme. That's what we all identify with. And the beauty of Judaism is when you can then pass on the message from the latke to the donut, from the donut to whatever other foods besides, so that they're all spreading the light. They're all sharing in the oil. They're all communicating the deeper message throughout. Thank you, Rabbi Shachat. Anybody else have any other questions? Last shot. We must have done an awesome job right here. Now for the closing remarks, we first turn to Rabbi Jacobson. Three minutes. Hi, my dear friends, do I have to say more? Just translate the words, Haman, Haman. Tash, do you know what a tash means? 
Anybody knows what a tash is? A pocket, a wallet. Already we hear an association with money. That's always a good thing. It's always encouraging and refreshing. The Jewish people need money. The rabbi told the shul, he says, there's a hole in the roof of the synagogue. I have good news and bad news. The good news is the money is in your tash. I'm sorry. The good news is I have all the money. The bad news is the money is in your tash. The money is in your pocket. But what else is a tash? A tash is a wallet. It's a receptacle. It's a vessel. It's a container. The ultimate purpose in life is to open yourself up to become a tash. To become a keli, a vessel. And a vessel for what? A vessel for the deepest lights, for the deepest energy, for the most nuclear explosions of goodness. And how do you reach the deepest lights, the deepest infinite blessings? When you transform the negative into the positive. When you take the haman and you turn the darkness into a source of light. What you're doing is you're creating a tash. You're creating a container for the most infinite elements of life. When you find the haman in your own life, Remember, open yourself up to become a tash, a container for the deepest energy. That which you fear most is what you need most. That which you think will destroy you, if you confront it and deal with it, it will heal you. It will build you. Fear nothing but fear itself. All you have heard here is somebody instilling fear in the Jewish people. Inculcating fear in the Jewish people. Afraid of Haman. We are more powerful than Haman. Haman originates in the tree of knowledge. We originate in the tree of life. My dear friends, this JLI historic conference should create a resolution. And the resolution should be that if I had it my way, Latkes should be banned from the Jewish language, from the Jewish culture, from Jewish civilization, from synagogues, from restaurants, from homes. What we should do is we should embrace the Hamantash. This is the future. This is destiny. We are already thinking about a consciousness post-exile. We want to transcend exile. We want to get into a state of redemption. And in the state of redemption, the whole world will become holistic and all will be transformed to express the glory of Almighty God forever and ever. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rabbi Jacobson. And now for the final closing remarks from Rabbi Shochet. He's calling for the banning of a food and then calls me insecure. <laughs> Haman was hanged in 356 BCE. Haman was from Shushan, otherwise known as Susa, Iran. Haman was a terrorist, a fundamentalist committing to wiping out a whole race who didn't believe in his way of life. Haman was the ultimate bona fide anti-Semite who hated Mordecai the Jew simply because he didn't bow to him. Here we are, 2,372 years later. Ask any American citizen what his biggest concern facing American soil is today, and they will invariably tell you, terrorism. Ask any universal Jew what he or she is most concerned about today, and they will invariably tell you anti-Semitism. Ask any Israeli security personnel what is the single biggest threat and risk to Israel's security today, and they will invariably tell you Iran. Haman is alive and well. And again, I suggest to you the Hamantash, therefore, is a very real and direct threat to national security. Far be it for me to call for bans on a food. Far be it for me to cast dispersion on an ancient Jewish ritual. But its name, as I demonstrated at the outset, is flawed. Its shape is fictional. Its contemporary fillings are corrupt. But above all else, it has too much negative connotation. You want to tell me it restores faith in the Jew, that it reminds us of how the Hamans of this world can be defeated? I say quite the contrary. Hamantash in that once a year biscuit confined to kosher bakeries in quiet Jewish neighborhoods only feeds the stereotype of the ghetto Jew keeping his head down, walking below the radar. Latkes, on the other hand, yes, they're filled with oil. And he admits to, in fact, eating so many of them. <laughs> and that connotes anointing, royalty, priesthood, majesty, Moshiach. It means being anointed with oil. It's about light. It's about permeation. Everything about the latke is about the life of the Jew. They are universal. They are available all year round. They are found in restaurants, kosher and non-kosher alike. You don't eat a latke and not think the Jew. 
Lutkus sent a message to Jew and non-Jew alike that we are here to stay. My worthy opponent has done a valiant job, but he was given an impossible task to try and extol the virtues of a feeble Hamantash. The only argument that works is that the Hamantash must remind me in my own quiet way of how I will always prevail. But you know what? You make a latka by taking a potato and grating it as he noted from the outset, thus reminding us how the life of the Jew through the ages may have been grated, shredded, torn apart. But did that get us down? No. If life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. And if life gives you potatoes and it shreds your potatoes, you make latkes. That is the story of the Jewish people. The principal defeat of tragedy by the power of hope, or in our case, the principal defeat of Haman, Ahasuerus, and every other anti-Semite on this planet by the power of the latke and everything it represents. And so, friends, as you go to vote shortly, the future of the latke is in your hands. Remember, you grate a potato, G-R-A-T-E. So I ask you on behalf of the American people and Jews the world over, and with no apologies to Donald Trump, make Lutkis great again. And so, folks, we have heard some of the deepest insights convincing arguments, diplomatic ribbing, and now for the moment of truth. Please take out your cell phones. We're going to vote. All right, for starters, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to show you the results of your initial vote for at the onset here, so please give your attention to the screens. The initial vote, I can't, oh, there we go. The Hamantash came in at 46%. The Latke at, is that 54? Who's standing in the way, that me? Yeah. 54%. And now for the final one, all right? The Hamantash at 35%, the Latke at 65%. I think it's quite obvious right here, the winner is none other than the Latke. We want to thank our esteemed debaters here for a great job. Everybody's invited to join us for a brief repast in the back of the room to either lubricate your kishkis with Latkes or get high on the Mun Hamantashen. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon.